Today, I've been edified by several leaders of prayer, both morning and night, and I've been edified by four different song leaders helping me to worship. All of us are grateful. And how I've been edified by this past discourse by Brother Curtis, as you have, so much research work, sickening situation, but we need to pray and work. We're thankful for his bringing it to our attention. And Brother Malone's speech just before him, oh, how much Bible he put into that lesson. I've been built up today, this morning, to hear Brother Eddie. I told him he did not prepare that discourse in 30 minutes, that resume of the prophetic preaching. And Brother Roper, he touched our hearts. The Roper family has helped us through the years in Australia, as well as in America. We're so proud what you're doing at Brown Trail. Proud of your elders. Pray for them. Tell them that you appreciate what they're doing. And they want nothing but the whole counsel of God. I'm thankful to that kind of man. And part of that whole counsel is purity. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and spoke to them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called God's children. Blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye, when men shall revile you and persecute you, say, all men of evil against you, falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For so persecuted the prophets which are before you, and great is your reward in heaven. Purity. What does the word mean? Purity. I read in Jeremiah, second chapter, verse 22, one of the sparse instances where the word S-O-A-P appears in our Bible. And I look up the word that Jeremiah used, and it's the same word that means purity. So that which is associated with soap is what God says is pure. Thus it's the opposite of dirtiness, uncleanness, that which defiles and contaminates. So we see a, exactly what that is, is pure. Then I read in Psalm 12, verse 7, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver, purified in a furnace of fire, purged seven times, purified. Here then is the picture God wants me to know about getting the dross out of silver ore. And so, though I've never seen it personally, maybe some of you have, silver ore in a pot being heated until the silver melts, and on the top of it the scum, the dross, which is to be screened away. Now that's purity when it's all screened away. And says the psalmist about the Bible, Pure words. How pure? 
as silver that's been heated up seven times in seven furnaces. That's getting down. Nothing unclean left. No dross, no scum, no trash. Pure. M.S. Mason used to say at Fried Hardeman, now that's the quintessence of the essence. The quintessence of the essence. He's the only man I ever heard say that. But that's what the psalmist here is saying about God's word. How pure it is. It's the quintessence of the essence of that purifying work of heating, melting the silver. But my subject tonight is not about silver, nor is it about the word of God, how pure it is, though that's a worthy subject. Now, purity. Now, I want you to buy one of those books. It will, from those discourses I've heard today, be edifying through the years. And I restudied this doctrine of purity when Brother Eddie wrote me the Bible meaning of that word. I checked into it every way I knew in those 66 books. And I put it in that lesson. But I'm not going over it tonight. You get one of those books if you want that kind of study in it. But I thought tonight you are tired how patient you've been. But I try to review with you that beatitude that discusses purity. Blessed are the pure in heart. What is the heart? Well, very seldom does the Bible talk about the physical heart. Second Samuel 18, it does mention that Joab put three darts into the heart of Absalom while he was hanging in the oak tree. Second Samuel, ninth chapter. No, it's Second Kings. Second Kings, the ninth chapter. You read about Jehu drawing a, a arrow in his bow with all of his might driving it into the back of wicked King Joram. The Bible says the arrow came out at his heart. Well, that's the physical heart. That's not what Jesus was talking about. How else does the Bible use the word heart? Blessed are the pure in heart. What is the Bible heart? Every gospel preacher preaches a sermon on heartfelt religion and shows what the Bible heart is. So I won't go into detail about that, but simply these two verses as we go along in this study. The first time you read about the word heart, mentioned in sacred scripture, Genesis 6, verse 5, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart we're only evil continually. I get the idea then that the Bible heart is your thinker, where your thoughts are. New Testament, same way, Acts 8.22. Repent the fool of this thy wickedness and pray God, if perhaps the thoughts of thy heart may be forgiven thee. So I am fully instructed as I start studying what Jesus meant Bless you, the pure in heart. He said, that mind of yours. No dirtiness. No filth. All the dross removed. Nothing in it that, ought be, that, ought, that doesn't belong there. I like sorghum lices. With or without hot biscuits, but better with the biscuits. And over the country here and there, Ms. McCord finds these jars of sorghum very expensive. They are more expensive when it says pure. But she has been jilted a few times that way. Sometimes when we got home with it, 
It had Cairo syrup mixed with it. That was not pure sorghum. A few times I bought some gasoline mixed with water. That's not pure gasoline. So, we get the idea what is to be pure, unmixed. Nothing but the genuine thing there. And so then, in this sense of it, an honest heart. One who is just the same inside as the outside. No hypocrisy. A double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Somebody was complimenting a preacher. She had run out of compliments. All us preachers loved them. She'd run out. She said, you're so smart, you must be that double-minded man that James was talking about. <laughs> well, that's nothing but hypocrisy, a fellow that talks to you one way and thinking something else. That's a impure heart. All right. There are those who say that your heart has to be wicked. And they misuse Jeremiah 17.9 to try to back it up. The heart is desperately wicked, exceedingly corrupt. Who can know it? Well, no, it's true that there are many people's hearts that are deceitful. Many of them desperately wicked, just trying to think up mean things to do. But that doesn't mean that everybody's heart's that way. That doesn't mean anybody's born with a depraved heart. That idea is a perversion. God's book teaches me, if I want to have an honest heart, if I want to have a pure heart, I can if I want to. It's just up to me. The psalmist said in the 24th Psalm, asking the question, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall dwell in his holy place? In other words, who's going to heaven? The answer, he that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul to vanity nor sworn deceitfully, he shall believe and receive a blessing from the Lord, God of his salvation. The psalmist believed that I can have a pure heart, that only pure hearted people going to heaven. Then you turn to the New Testament, 1 Timothy 1, 3. Now the end of the commandment. What is it, Paul? The end objective of all commandments in the Bible. That goal toward which my master wants me to strive. The end of the commandment is love out of a pure heart and a good conscience and faith unfeigned. May these young preachers who are in Brown Trail School personally have pure hearts. A young preacher was given the commandment, 1 Timothy 5.22, Keep thyself pure. Yes, he has friends to help him. And he has prayers of good people to encourage him. But when it's all said and done, he's got to get with it. Keep thyself pure. But is it super? Is it above his ability? That's what the Bible is showing me. I can do it if I want to. And if my heart's not pure, it's because I don't want it that way. I want it defiled. Second Timothy 2, 22. The same young preacher was told. While he was yet a young man, we old men are beyond this, youthful us. But there are many young preachers, and they are commanded, flee youthful lust. On the other hand, do what? Follow after righteousness, faith, love, peace with all them that call upon the Lord out of a pure heart. Paul, you're telling Timothy that people call upon the Lord out of a pure heart. It's a reality. It's practical for Christian people in the church everywhere to have pure hearts. Yes, says Timothy, you emulate those people, those that call upon them out of a pure heart. And in 1 Peter 1, you remember, 22, seeing then that ye have purified, yes, that's what we're talking about, seeing then that you have purified your souls 
All the dross is gone, the sin, the uncleanness, the defilement. Seeing then that you've purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and unfeigned love of the brothers, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Yes, Peter thought we could do it. And in 1 John 3, oh, how you heard Avon emphasize that beautiful passage. But it belongs in this lesson too. Every man that hath this hope in him waits on God to give him a pure heart by direct operation of the Spirit. Nay, every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself. So it just boils down to that. I've got to get with it now. After that said and done, which means strict honesty, of course, you're honest with everybody. What you say with your lips is what you're saying in your heart. You're not a double dealer. That's being pure-minded. After all that said, and it should be, God has taught it. He also teaches this. As much as I, the God of heaven, as it were, esteem purity and despise hypocrisy, and as much as I have barred the gates of heaven to hypocrites, Oh, how great is purity, but purity alone is not enough to get me there. I need to recognize that too. So I read now about the Apostle Paul. Paul, what about you before you became a Christian? Acts 23, 1, men and brothers, I have lived in all good conscience before God to this day. Paul, you've never been a hypocrite? Never. All your life, before you was baptized and ever? Right. He could say, I've been honest all the way through. He was a pure-minded man, always trying to do what's good and right. But that didn't make him right. So as much as this lectureship exalts purity, Alone, it's not enough to get us there. I see Nathaniel. Who was Nathaniel? At first, a skeptic. When Philip first told him about Jesus and said that Jesus came from the town of Nazareth, you remember Nathaniel's answer. Sarcasm. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said, come and see. So the two walked along to meet Jesus. As they approached, Jesus said, Behold, an Israelite in whom is no guile, no trickery, no deception. There's an honest man walking up to meet me. Other people may not know that about you, but you know in your heart if you are honest. And Nathaniel knew that he was an honest man. And he knew that he'd never seen Jesus before. He says, how'd you know me? Jesus said, while you were standing under that fig tree, before Philip called you, I saw you. Ah, oh, Nathaniel realized this man has power that has to come from God. Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. He was convinced. But the thought about it right now is, as he approached Jesus, he was pure-minded. He was honest. A pure-minded skeptic, but honest in that skepticism. Then when the evidence was presented, that Jesus is divine. He changed over. He became a believer. He confessed his Lord. Yes, honesty before he's baptized and after he's baptized, so to speak. Yes, Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. All right. So the picture is in of honesty. 
And he was a man already honest, pure-minded, but he wasn't ready to go to heaven. And there could be those in this audience and many audiences that are strictly honest in their dealings with men and God, so sincere, but how they need to learn, purity alone isn't enough. And the last thought tonight, blessed the pure in heart, for they shall see God. No, if I had more time, this audience doesn't need it anyway. I would mention what it means to obey the gospel. That's necessary besides purity of heart. But get to that conclusion then. Oh, it's precious. Shall see God. No, you've never seen him. At present, with these eyes, no man has ever seen God, John 1, 18. And he'd kill you if he did. But if we live as we should, with pure hearts, and become good Christians, we shall see him, said the Savior. Sit and pause for a few moments about that grand thought. I used to love to see my mother's eyes, and you know what I mean by that. And there are friends sitting here tonight whose eyes I like to see sparkle and show love and friendship. You want to see people you love, but you've never seen God. He's promised it, though, said the Savior. And it's not, he wasn't the first one that promised it. Jesus' great, 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 great grandfather, David. Psalm 17, verse 15. As for me, what about you, David? As for me, I shall behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy light. That's a precious verse of Scripture. Old Testament, too. Looking beyond the New Testament to heaven. Yes. David said, I'm going to see God. And before you leave the Old Testament, Job says, I'd like to testify. 1925. What do you have to say, Job, about seeing God? Something you can't do now. I know him whom I have believed. No. I know my Redeemer liveth. And at the last you'll stand upon the earth. And that's a difficult verse. I won't have time to go into it. But some think. So stand upon the graves as it were when his word goes forth. Though he personally will never stand on the earth. But to go on with it. I know that my Redeemer liveth. And at the last you'll stand upon the earth. And after my skin, that is, this flesh, is destroyed, then without my flesh, I shall see God, whom I shall see on my side, and not as a stranger. I'll know him as, I, as if I'd known him all my life. He won't be a stranger to me. And that's Old Testament. Then you come again to the New Testament and you heard Avon give this passage. Now we children of God, it doth not appear what we shall be, but we know this. What do we know, John? We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And Revelation 22, 4, what do you say? The Apostle John, same one. His servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face. Oh, that's a great book. And that's the reward of purity, with all the connected with it. 
I'll turn the service back to Brother.